Welcome to Deloitte's Debrief Tax Webcast Series in Asia Pacific. Our webcast today is from our Transfer Pricing Series and is titled Developing an Operational Transfer Pricing Framework in a Practical Application. My name is Mark Carlton and I'm a director based in Australia. I had the pleasure of hosting today's webcast and I'm joined by two speakers, Daniel, Daniel Lau and Mamit Bij. Daniel is a tax director based in the Philippines and Mamit is a tax partner based in India. You should be able to access our buyers on the left side of the screen. Before I introduce the agenda for today's webcast, there are some features worth pointing out in relation to our webcast console. Firstly, all users are on listen-only mode, uh, although if you have any content-related questions, you can submit at any time in the Q&A box at the bottom right of the screen. We'll do our best to respond to your questions during the presentation. Secondly, all PC users can explore the icons at the bottom of the screen for additional content. If you want to download today's slides and related publications, please go down to the download and links box. Further, mobile users can view the slides and also answer the survey on screen. Lastly, if you require an attendance record for this event, you will receive an automated email with the CPE certificate after watching for 50 minutes. So with that, let's just go on to the next slide and look at the agenda. So broadly, what we want to cover off today are four key elements. And the first is really to get a base understanding of the TP landscape that we're working with, to really understand why we're we even talking about operational transfer pricing today. Uh, then we'll cover the second point, and that is understanding what is operational transfer pricing, and then look at a few different frameworks for understanding the building blocks and to understand how to prioritise uh, next steps when going about that journey. And I think it's then a really good sort of situation we have here with two experts looking at uh, two case studies in particular where they have applied these frameworks in practice. So Daniel is going to lead a data management case study where he looks at a lot of quick wins that he's helped clients with and building that foundation for the next steps. And Mamid is then going to be looking through a more enhanced solution uh, that he's helped clients with around implementation of transfer pricing policies. So why don't we just kick on into the next slide and just really set the scene about what is the transfer pricing landscape that we're actually dealing with. And Deloitte do a transfer pricing opera or tax operate survey periodically. And there's some great insights um, from that. And we won't have time to go into all of the details of that, but there are some key themes that are worth discussing today. And the first one is, is when you look at what tax leaders are having to deal with, what they have noted is that the transfer, transfer pricing function has been increasingly been asked by the business as part of the tax function to help provide value add insights. And this is about driving you know, strategic business decisions. And so tax leaders are very, very cognizant of that. Uh, and that's being driven, I think, uh, in ways which we're not going to see less than over time, particularly as m and activity has been increasing. And we're seeing a lot of key tax topics on the horizon, such as the pillar and globe rules. So really, tax leaders are very cognizant of that. But then on the flip side, what we do have is revenue authorities who are becoming much more sophisticated in what they're requiring of taxpayers. And that added complexity has seen itself in a few different ways. So for one, what we're seeing is a much more granular approach uh, to administering tax and a much more complex and sophisticated way in terms of how they collect, collect it. So we see that uh, over the last six or so years in country by country reporting, the granular requirements, the electronic lodgement requirements, but we're also seeing that going a lot further in a lot of countries, particularly in Europe, where revenue authorities are actually wanting access to the financial reporting systems. So you can see that tax leaders and all the tax leaders that we talk to on a day-to-day -day basis, they really are trying to manage this push-pull relationship where they are being asked to derive value-add work where they are going to put a lot of their people from the tax function um, to focus on, but then equally, they have to be able to deal with this complex environment and increasing burden, burden from revenue authorities. So we don't want to say that this is necessarily a new issue per se, because arguably an increasing burden with limited resources is something that tax teams and tax functions have had to deal with for a long time. But it certainly is a lot different of late because what we're seeing is that sophistication um, of the actual problem itself um, really does lend itself to understanding the digital tax aspirations and journey a lot of tax functions are going through. And so that's why we're seeing that the discussion around operational transfer pricing has become much more prevalent with our 
with our clients and with taxpayers in general. So if we move to the next slide, I mean, what we have seen is that a lot of taxpayers um, are and tax leaders are really saying, look, we think operational transfer pricing should be the priority of the tax and transfer pricing function in the short to medium term. And that's actually coming through in a lot of the conversations we're having. So that is a bit of a snapshot about the transfer pricing landscape, but I think it'd be really good uh, fear or sense, to get a sense of what is going through the minds of everyone in this virtual team or call that we're going through. And if we could just jump to the polling question, I would ask that everyone able, um, could just answer this question about how do you actually view your digital transformation journey? And within that, we can include operational transfer pricing. But whilst that's actually happening, I mean, I'd love to get your views based on your experience and, and what you think the digital transformation process is going through. Do you think it's being prioritised like it should be? Uh, thanks, Mark, for bringing me in uh, at your question. I must say the global push for the tax transparency and the increased scrutiny faced by multiple taxpayers has really elevated the digitalization to be a, become a priority issue. And tax leaders are recognizing that, that they can no longer risk maintaining the status quo. So for sure, digital transformation is a key priority for tax leaders. But at the same time, as you just mentioned, the tax leaders also need to balance multiple competing priorities. Now they, we have observed increased number of tax audit coming in, that they have to manage tax aspects of implementing a new business plan. So there are multiple competing priorities they need to look at, which might limit the speed of implementation. But surely there is a significant focus and willingness we are observing the, the TP function getting from a digitalization perspective. Thanks for that, Nanit. And I guess when we look at the survey results here, I mean, certainly what we're seeing is a bit of a trend where it is becoming the immediate or short to medium term priority for everyone on this call. And I think another way of even looking at that as well is if we just jump onto the next slide, just to sort of drive this one home, what we're actually seeing is that a lot of tax leaders have the intent on prioritising the modernisation of their tax and transfer pricing function. And so when you look at this question here, it's actually got a couple of layers to it. I mean, certainly about three quarters of the respondents are saying that, yes, we are trying to be very proactive in this. And it's acknowledging that it perhaps is a bit of a journey and that there is a continuous improvement process involved. But equally, I think another point that comes out here is that nearly half of the respondents are also doing this um, arguably from building from the very base level, i.e. looking at their entire architecture. And another way to perhaps think about that one is that we're seeing an enormous wave um, of next-gen ERP implementations across the industry, across all companies. And so really it's perhaps a sign in some of these responses that tax teams are also trying to grapple with that. So now that we sort of have a bit of a, a sense as to why operational transfer pricing seems to be so prevalent, if we just jump to the next slide, let's tackle the question of, well, what is operational transfer pricing? Well, how can we think about it? And this slide is really great because it does outline some of the, the intricate layers involved in understanding operational transfer pricing. Because fundamentally, the traditional view of OTP is that it's about getting it right or getting the transfer pricing policy right in the books. And what this slide shows is that there are lots of different facets and components of the business that are part of the process to derive outcomes and derive deliverables. But I'd like to challenge that for the purpose of this call and say, well, perhaps it's a bit simpler than that. So whilst this is absolutely a very, very good slide and there's lots of detail, but if we move on to the next slide and just take a step back for a moment, what we can actually see is that ultimately, Transfer pricing and what we're trying to tackle here as, a, as, as transfer pricing practitioners is we're, we're trying to look at the pricing of related party dealings. And for all related party dealings, there's a transfer pricing life cycle involved. And when we have a dealing, we'll start at the very first um, step and that is planning. And that might mean benchmarking, understanding the terms and conditions of that, of that arrangement, implementing up a, an agreement building templates and calculation work papers so that we can come up with the amounts that have to be put through as journals. Then we may move to the evidencing stage and documenting that, turning it to disclosures for a tax return. And then at some stage, it may lead to defending that arrangement uh, with revenue authorities and the like. 
But ultimately, it is a life cycle. And so laws change, uh, policies change, dealings change. And so we may need to go back to square one and go back to the planning stage. But the point is, is that as a transfer pricing function, there are a lot of different tasks involved for the humble transfer pricing policy. And so that's why when we think about where does traditional OTP typically sit, it would sit at that streamlined step where we're saying we have to get it right in the books. But ultimately what you've just heard there is the transfer pricing function deals with more than just that. It deals with a whole series of tasks. And when you start breaking those tasks down into their core building blocks, it looks a lot similar to what we have to deal with when designing OTP solutions. And those are the ones that we're seeing on screen. And because for every task, be it a disclosure or be it a calculation, it's always going to involve people and stakeholders who are part of the capturing of the data, classifying data, calculating, analysis, reviewing, approving, and so on. But then equally, all of those stakeholders are going to be part of a process for that task. And so whilst it risks oversimplifying it, because as I noted on the earlier slide, there were other things such as the controllers involved with that process or people, there really is that nice fundamental building block aspect when we start thinking of OTP across all of the TP function. And then let's not forget that we, for every single task, we're going to have data and data management. And transfer pricing is very unique in the way that it needs data and the type of data that it needs. So it is very, very granular for one, and it's only become more and more granular over time in terms of the requirements to revenue authorities. But equally, the way we use data is also very, very unique because we may have something such as a very particular disclosure, which is different all around the world, notwithstanding it's about the same thing. And then equally, we may, may have to do things like segmented P&Ls, which is based on the transfer pricing function characterization. So the point is, is that the data management and the skills involved are very unique to transfer pricing, but equally they can apply to all of the tasks. So then the last building block there that is we're probably seeing on screen and I haven't mentioned is technology. And that is somewhat by design because we don't really want to create a misconception that operational transfer pricing is just about technology. Um, and the reason for that is that a lot of the quick wins, particularly in the use cases that you get to see from the me and Dan, I mean, they also had to start at the fundamental building blocks of people and process, particularly for those easy wins. Um, the other thing to think about with technology is that it does encompass all of the other building blocks as well. So if you implement new technology, there has to be some stakeholder management, change management, training. Equally, there's data components and process that you have to be concerned with as, long, as well as internal controls and the like. So perhaps one way to think about technology is that it's an enabler for change. Uh, as part of the OTP journey. And a really easy example of that is if we look at Humble, the Humble Excel model. So we could do a lot of work to make great improvements in Excel, but at some point we may cap out the potential of it. So we actually have to move on from Excel to another type of technology. But that's just an easy example there. So if we move to the next slide, now that we've touched on, okay, well, what is a framework for considering OTP? And if now we think about the operational transfer pricing function as a series of tasks, how do we learn to prioritize that as part of the journey? Because that can sometimes be the hard thing in building the business case. And so that's why we like to think of it in this sort of context and say, well, if we were to instigate change for that particular task using OTP principles, do I see quality improvements? So efficiencies, uh, so consistencies, robustness of calculations, do I see improvements like that? Secondly, do I see efficiency? So am I streamlining the process so that my most important resource in the tax function, be it the people and the tax knowledge, can be put somewhere else? Am I making those efficiency gains? And then thirdly, is there value add? Now, if I was to put in place value add, sometimes that can be hard to manifest itself or to see it. But perhaps an example, just the way to think about it is, if I were to do a task a little bit more frequently, perhaps then I can become proactive in managing risks based on a greater frequency of that task being carried out. So that's just one small example how value add can come about. But then equally on the last two that you see on screen around managing risks and governance, ultimately these are things that you do wanna see as part of the business case, because ultimately we're seeing that from revenue authorities as well. We're seeing C-suite wanting to see how tax risks are being managed in the TP function. So these all form part of a framework for helping prioritize where in that value chain of the OTP function you should be 
focusing on. So then just to round this segment out and just moving to the next slide, what you've heard so far is a bit of a framework about what is operational transfer pricing. And you can see how arguably it's evolved from the thinking that it's very much about the policy, but actually it's about applying core building blocks across all of the tasks of the TP function. And in the end, this gets this is where Deloitte is beginning, you know, thinking about the TP function as an end-to-end -end process or a value chain. And what we would like to think of as operationalizing transfer pricing, because people, process, data, and technology are going to be evident in all of the different steps you can see here, notwithstanding it's starting from the very rawest data in the ERP all the way through to the reporting requirements that that function has. So we've touched on the frameworks, and um, Mamed and Dan will go through some of those frameworks in practice and how they've been applied. But before we get there, why don't we touch on, okay, well, what are going to be some of the pain points that we're going to be talking about in those use cases, and what are people seeing in this group? So I'll just go to the next polling question. Um, what are some of the biggest pain points in your organisational process? So you can choose more than one. But Dan, just while that's going, um, because I know you're going to be talking about how you dealt with some of these pain points. I think it's a good segue, but in your experience, what has been a standout pain point for your clients? Yeah. Thanks, Mark, uh, for the question. Um, I think by far, visibility on computations and allocation keys um, would probably be a clear answer, right? I've been in a few markets, no matter which market I've been, one of the first questions you get from the tax authorities is, oh, you, you get $100 of charges. How did you come up with this calculation, right? What cost allocation key did you use? You got this EBIT margin here for this for this company. Um, how did you come up with that? Why is it 6.5%? Why isn't it 6%? Isn't that your policy, right? This reconciliation, always very challenging. Local teams don't have that data. They need to ask group, but who has who, who has it in the, in the group, right? Yeah. And then they, I mean, do you have anything to add on that one? Yeah, yeah, sure. And like uh, Daniel mentioned, I mean, wherever you go, I would say multiple of the pain points do exist. But what I see in particular is that there are processes which are too manual and it's increasingly becoming a challenge because if you see the tax function is also having their own timelines by which they will close the whole of numbers so that finance could take it forward for closers. And there is increasing pressure on how to save the time and how to reduce the manual intervention and make sure there is no probably risk of a misstatement. So I think the, the manual processes and the standardizations are gaining much more importance. Of it. And, and as I've just pushed the survey results here, I think this is what we're seeing um, also amongst this virtual group. And I think a takeaway of that in the last polling question is that we are going to see a lot of commonality in pain points, what people are striving to do in the, their intentions in the tax function. But equally too, the benefit of that is that we're going to see um, solutions and that that can be scalable across the entire market. So there is going to be a lot of experience there about how to go about solving these problems. So with that, Dan, um, we'll move on to the next slide. I'll pass it over to you in relation to case study one. Yeah. Thanks for that, Mark. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Um, as Mark mentioned, um, for this uh, particular segment, I'll be focusing on some real, on a real life case um, for a client that we're helping out at the moment, right? Hopefully, um, the framework that Mark has introduced earlier will take a look at some concrete examples on how we actually see that in practice, right? Now, the, uh, the case study itself is probably more what we consider a tactical use case of, of operational transfer pricing, right? It's OTP in the traditional sense. So what does that mean? Well, rather than the end-to-end -end, um, value chain of you know, data management that Mark was talking about earlier, we focus on the management of the actual TP policy. So you have something on paper, how do you translate it to your books, right? What controls, what systems do you have in place, right? Now, the objective of this case study is to show how, again, the humble Excel file is able to become a powerful tool in solving this issue. And then we'll walk through how the conversation evolved from this point-based Excel solution to something that's much more extensive because of you know the client's actual needs, right? It became an end-to-end -end financial transformation, right? So first up, I'll give a background of the project that we that, that we had. So the client was a 
an Asian-based conglomerate. It was a business process outsourcing company, sales and um, doing sales and marketing, you know, consulting, digital marketing, right? And it also operates a few contact centers, like call centers, right? It was a legacy client of Deloitte, and the and what happened was that the Asian HQ actually acquired a regional Southeast Asian business, right? Now that ROHQ um, managed the whole region as well as operations in in the Americas. Now, what Deloitte did was we helped design the transfer pricing framework that they should be following, right? And in phase two of the project, we helped create the operational transfer pricing framework to implement that, right? Now, in terms of the business restructure, um, we've got the ROHQ company, right? Um, they have all the residual entrepreneurial profits and loss, right? You've got the contact center entities with, you know, percentage of targeted OM, I'm sure you're all familiar with that business model, right? And underneath that, again, you've got the contact center support entities, which were essentially the call centers. So they're remunerated on a cost plus, right? Why am I mentioning the business structure? Well, because managing the pricing policy for this, that's where the challenge came in, right? That unfortunately, the client did not have a centralized team that could monitor how this was being implemented, right? So it was really up to the local country teams to, 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 to figure out, okay, you've got this direction, this TP policy that regional gave them. How do we exercise that? How do we action that on local markets, right? And I mean, if you move through to the extreme left corner of, of the slide, you'll see some of the key challenges that the company ended up facing, right? Um, because you're relying on local country teams, there's always gonna be issues with data consistency. There was just different ways that everybody were do was doing things, right? Um, there was no central oversight. There was no visibility by HQ or regional on who's actually doing what. Like um, the amount of work, the amount of time needed to go through all of these, all, all of the local country data um, was, was very time consuming, right? They were, they were relying on multiple data sources. There were multiple ERP systems and there were no standardized formats um, for any work papers that the client was using, right? Um, there was issues with how the client was classifying costs, right? Um, because of the three layered structure of the company, um, it was very important that the group is able to isolate, okay, which costs should stay in local um, entity, right? Which costs are common costs that might need to be borne by ROHQ, right? Which costs were common costs that needs to be allocated out to all the different entities, right? There was a, there was a big challenge because of how manual and the, the lack of a central team to monitor all of this, right? Now, what ended up happening was, and what actually instigated this conversation was funny enough, um, COVID. We helped them design their transfer pricing policy, right? Um, when COVID hit, all of a sudden, there was a lot of difficulties in, and, and there was a lot of questions being asked in, okay, how do we implement uh, this TP policy now with COVID-related expenses, impacts um, to turnover in a lot of these um, different affiliate entities, right? What costs needs to be um, remaining in lo local call centers, which ones need to be transferred out. There was inconsistent, there was no standard way of doing this, right? So it became really important for the client to have a conversation with us, okay, how do we tackle this issue, right? So the ask of the client to us, a few of their priorities was one, the consolidation of data management to the central team, right? Make sure they had a way um, to have full visibility on what was being done by all the local entities, right? The second priority was to make sure there was that consistency, that standardization, okay, all these different Excel sheets, all these different formats of ways of doing things. Let's make sure that we, we streamline all of that, right? And thirdly, which I'm sure you are all familiar with, there was actually a bit of a limitation of budget, right? Because they were actually going through a larger financial transformation journey. So they wanted a solution that was um, easy and quick to implement, right? Now, Considering all of this, what we ended up coming up with was actually developing a very effective solution from the humble Excel file, right? We helped the client in designing a centralized Excel sheet that would allow them to 
manage and monitor all of the different entities, you know, the, the call center entities, the sales entities, and link it to the pricing policy that we had to design for them, right? Should they get a return on OM? Should they get a cost plus? What cost goes into that, right? How do we calculate the TP adjustment, right? Um, what we also did was we made sure that we could um, introduce a very simple impact assessment with an adjustment in one entity, what would be the impact on the overall group? How much taxes ends up being paid by the, by the overall group from these different adjustments, right? Um, a second feature of that solution was we standardized everything. We standardized the cost base of all of the entities. We standardized the allocation keys, right? Um, as I'm sure you're aware, intra-group services, um, if you need to allocate you know, certain common costs, you need to have a robust allocation key, right? So the central Excel file actually housed all of the, um, you know, key information needed to operationalize this, right? If it's based on headcount, we have that headcount, right? If we have turnover, we have that turnover, right? So it was all there at a single source. Now, um, another important feature of the solution was the degree of automation that we could um, sort of bring to it. We used macros to automate whatever we could, right? Cost categorizations so of, you know, specific GL line items, some of the analytics, et cetera, right? And we also built checks within the sheets to make sure that we're able to recalculate everything, that all the output um, within that work paper was accurate, right? And, 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 and was generated in a more efficient manner. Of course, you end up getting very quick wins, right? Um, data suddenly became more accessible. Um, you have the central team that house all the data for the whole regional group, right? You had better internal controls from the central team, right? A single layer of review up there to make sure policy is actually being implemented correctly, right? You now have standard templates, standard classifications, a standard process, everything became much easier. And because of that, data cycle was suddenly reduced significantly to several weeks. Historically, um, this client, um, if they were lucky, could get semi-annual data or maybe quarterly data, right? But what? Uh, but now they could actually um, have, update their financial data month by month, right? Why was that important? The, the client was particularly um, cash strapped in their local entities, so they needed a better way to manage their, their, their cash flows, right? So adjustments to their true TP policies, to their intergroup charges, can now be done uh, in case any particular entity had cash flow issues, for example, right? And this was a point that I think Mark was touching on earlier. Um, we need to have our tax and transfer pricing team elevated from that routine day-to-day -day that they typically do to a more strategic function, right? To, to, to contribute to this kind of strategic decision-making. Next slide, please. Now, not everything was, was was all well and good because obviously there are limitations to an Excel-based solution, right? There are still some weaknesses, some challenges that needed to be addressed. Um, the data extraction, for example, it was something that was still very manual. Um, there was no direct connection to ERP systems. Local countries were still required to prepare their own you know, calculations to feed into the central sheet, right? It was not an end-to-end -end solution, right? the analytics, the data visualization, it was under the limitations, you know, uh, that we typically see with Excel, right? Other platforms, for example, can analyze multidimensional um, data, right? For different types of scenario testing. Excel um, can do that to an extent, but it's of course very clunky, right? And of course, Excel being Excel, it's scalable to an extent, but there is a limit before it, the sheet becomes too cumbersome, before the, the, the tool becomes too cumbersome, right? Also very important, there was no centralized data lake. So tax, transfer pricing, finance, we're still using different data. There needed to be that manual effort to try and link all of that together, which is also very challenging, right? And lastly, and most importantly, I think, there was no guarantee from the central team's perspective that, okay, everything we see here on paper, everything looks good, calculations are robust, is this actually being implemented correctly by local teams? Is this what we will see at the end of the financial year, right? Sometimes when these issues are flagged, it's too late. 
because typically you'd notice them when the books are closed, when um, you're preparing your transfer pricing documents. So there are limitations on that, right? And because of this, um, we, we found, the client and Deloitte found ourselves in a, a bit of a crossroads, right? We, uh, we had to weigh between two choices. Will we continue with a more point-based solution like Excel, um, you know, using MIME or maybe Altrix, you know, Power BI for visualization? Or do we need to go to the other route? Do we need to create something that's more end-to-end, -end, right? Now, when we're discussing this, a few questions sort of arose, right? If we rely on a point-based solution um, and we manage to accelerate or, automatic, uh, or automate specific tasks, what about others that are not covered within scope? Right? Are there other pressure points you need to address that a point-based solution just can't handle? Right? If we generate segmented reports, for example, or we need to simulate different scenarios, how easy is it to do that on whatever tool you've got now, on an Excel, for example? Right? Um, the degree of control that the centralized team has, for example, is it enough for your requirement? If the tax office suddenly comes in, they knock on your door, they say, okay, um, we're checking your current TP governance framework. What have you got? Like what controls do you have in place? Can a single Excel file um, provide proof that there has been a lot of um, robust checks and diligence, right? Is there a control framework that we can show to the tax office, right? And for that single data ecosystem, is that important for the company? Right. Do you need to make sure that there's a reconciliation between the finance data, the tax data, the TP data? Is that a big issue or is it not? All right. Now, linking this to what we will see in the future, BEPS 2.0, that will add even more complexity. Right. Um, going forward, you can't rely on manual systems when you look at BEPS 2.0. Um, will my current systems actually be able to assess any impact from BEPS 2.0? Can I manage my compliance in the future? or is the answer in a more end-to-end -end solution, right? So I'll pause there. And this is probably a very good segue to Manmeet, who actually has a live case where we're assisting a client in developing this end-to-end -end solution. Manmeet, over to you. Hey, thanks, Daniel, uh, for sharing your experience. It's really helpful for clients to get a view on various aspects that may impact the approach adopted by the transfer pricing function for managing intercompany pricing. Uh, I must also acknowledge, like you mentioned, use of the spreadsheets for managing transfer pricing has been very commonly observed. Though it limits the data visibility or data availability more at the people running the calculations, probably not providing an overall view to the central teams. But more importantly, uh, given the increasing complexities of the business operations, a significant increase in intercompany transaction volumes we have been noticing and the increased focus by multiple stakeholders, let it be tax authorities, governance uh, stakeholders, on the intercompany data has been really driving tax function to rethink about their digital aspirations. Do they want to maintain the status quo, rely more on maybe disintegrated computations through spreadsheet or want to really shift to something which is more integrated, more end-to-end, -end, so the next case study that we are discussing is for a listed group, uh, Asia Pacific group, which is having multiple legal entities in more than 10 jurisdictions. The group had multiple intercompany arrangements in place involving global management cross-charge, regional management cross-charge, the central IT cost cross-charge, sale of finished goods, material, uh, marketing services, sales commissions, which really makes the overall transfer pricing arrangement much more complicated. And there were certain, I would say, added complexities that we noted, and many of them would resonate, I'm sure, with, with our viewers on this call. Uh, regional structure setup. You also emphasized on that point, Daniel. Uh, you have a cost coming in from global to region, region to local, which now comprises of multiple subsegments and multiple places where the cost originated. So at the local entity level, usually, there would be a blur on the audit trail and the flows and the competition mechanism. Uh, in a lot of cases, the local entities would receive a single invoicing service fee, but the components on how much of it belongs to global, how much of it belongs to region, how much it belongs to maybe uh, procurement, sourcing, 
IT management, that, that becomes a bit of gap for the local entities to bridge. There were multiple allocation keys, but there were even allocation keys for, or multiple keys for single cost component. As an example, for IT alone, we observed there were more than 20 allocation keys getting used, different keys for ERP, different for different kind of licenses within Microsoft, different kind of licenses used by specific functions. So for example, finance was using analytical platform, different keys, procurement was, was using a different software for their purpose, a different key, cloud space, a different key. So more than 20 keys alone in a single cost component. How do you manage that and retain a complete control? In addition, the group companies were having multiple functionalities. So they would be dealing with group companies, maybe as a captive manufacturer or a service provider. They would also be dealing with third parties, which requires now multiple segmentations, multiple allocations to be created before you start implementing TP policies. In addition to that, there were also certain cost components which would be attributable to limited set of companies. Again, something which will be resonated by different people on the call. For example, quality control function at headquarters only attributable to manufacturing. So you need a different sub-segment of saying, okay, these companies where this cost center might be attributed. The global sales and marketing is going to be attributed to entities other than the captive manufacturers or the regional cost might be attributed to some regional companies. So this was really making the overall process much more complicated and adding to Daniel, what you mentioned last time, uh, when the complexity increases, maybe the limitation or, or the reliance on the spreadsheet really starts becoming more challenging because this would require now even defining subsets. And it was also observed that the manual controls over these processes on how do you define subsets, how do you make sure each cost is uh, appropriately covered was proving insufficient. There were historical instances when some of the numbers were not computed the way they were supposed to be. There were also scenarios wherein the cost attributable to a local entity was actually retained in the regional headquarter, arising primarily out of, for example, exchange control challenges, experience with local tax authorities during earlier audits, et cetera. So now it was another task to track the cost that was retained in regional headquarter belonging to other entities so that it's not getting allocated to maybe other legal entities, it's not getting claimed as tax deductible, et cetera. Uh, one or two more important points, pricing dependence, very uh, interesting aspect. There were transactions which were in a way interdependent so when you, for example, change the IT cost allocable to a distributor, it would trigger a simultaneous change in the intercompany purchase price. So one had to also manage how many relationship and to what level or tier you define the transaction at. A tier zero completely independent, a tier one, which might depend upon another transaction. And last, again, a common challenge we have been hearing of late is attrition and ownership of data. I mean, with the high speed of attrition uh, experienced in the last couple of years, there is challenge to visibility of historical data and who owns up that data. So anytime, I mean, you go back three years and say, by the way, can you give me this computations? You start realizing multiple people trying to figure out where would that computation be or, or was it appropriately done? Was it a different way which was more appropriate to do it? Uh, with this and going by the background, there were manual spreadsheets presently being used, which was really making things challenging because inputs were coming from multiple team IT might be giving number of users for multiple kind of subcomponents. Sale team would be giving the eligible sales use for certain allocations, commissions, businesses would be giving the details of specific projects, really making uh, life quite complicated for, for the central team to manage all intercompany transactions. One of the outcome and also a driver to that was, given this high amount of time manual activity, several transactions were actually priced basis the budgets. And they were not actually trued up at year end because Showing up would require a rerun of the entire analysis, reaching out to so many stakeholders, uh, making sure you have the updated information available, etc. And this is where a lot of local entities were also really challenging the computation methodologies. They were saying, look, you can't do everything on budget. You expected on sale, of course, there would be overhead of tax, but there were reduction in overhead in certain cases, there were increase. You need to sort of make a quick change to the pricing. So the local entities were also getting conscious about what TP risk they might have in case of a probable audit, which was one of the key driver. And the other key driver, like I earlier mentioned, there is increasing focus on enhancing the efficacy of the transfer pricing processes, reducing the time spent, and in a way, reducing the overall time to reporting to the external stakeholders. So this was the other key driver. And the third one was making sure there is 
a higher control on computation and internal controls. So this was the key driver and where the key priorities the client decided was automating the, the intercompany computation, centralizing at a different place with multiple sub objectives, achieve a shorter time span, avoid or minimize any year end adjustment, making sure there is consistency in application of policies and at the same time reducing manual processes and risk. Uh, it was also a key priority to have a clear visibility to data so that the local entities do not fear that there could be a transpising risk in case of an audit and also ensuring a clear audit trail and maintaining data over a large period of time. I mean, it should not be so that you are supposed to furnish a data four years down the line and suddenly you realize, oh, I, I don't have that access any longer or we need to find out multiple uh, stakeholders who might be able to help. Now coming to the solution, at the outset, the first important point to discuss with the, with the client was, what should be the platform of choice? So, and there were the existing platforms that group finance team was using for the purpose of their analytics, for the purpose of consolidation reporting, which in a way already had several data points residing in it, acting like you emphasized also, Daniel, more like a data lake for a lot of data uh, purposes. So that was selected as the platform of choice with the alternative also discussed about should there be, let's say, additions to the existing ERP on multiple reports or change to the source ERP itself. But it was envisaged it might require involvement of larger set of stakeholders, might take longer time. So therefore, the idea was to go ahead with the existing analytics platform already being considered and also leverage on existing data to that extent. Another key learning or key aspect during this whole exercise was the focus on source data mapping. I mean, uh, we experienced that identifying the right data and right stakeholders is actually more difficult than initially envisaged. Uh, one starts with the fact, oh, there is already a competition in place, so you need to automate that. I mean, uh, it's not about you are going to find something new, but in reality, it was much more complex than what initially was thought of. And some of the reasons there is because data sources are really scattered, involve multiple stakeholders who might be feeding in data from multiple perspectives. There was unstructured data, which may not really be as useful as you initially thought it to be. There are also scenarios when the data might be aggregated. So for example, <clears throat> giving extending the IT cost example we're taking. IT cost might be sitting in a single cost center, but within that costing, there are 15, 20 different drivers you need to apply. So how do you identify cost for application of each individual driver? There were alternatives. You could go by maybe vendors. You could consider modifying ERP to get more details, or you could even go by maybe the uh, risk assessment of what if you use a central key? So even if you had 15, 20, the whole exercise also focused on do you need to optimize and simplify that structure to say okay right now i have 20 but i noticed even if i run five my impact on the charge that i'm making may not be more than plus minus two percent plus minus three percent i'm a reality threshold which helps you reduce the complexity or or the drivers won't really apply on the total model now the solution also is setting up the drivers flexibility and visibility so for each allocation key the central team can actually identify and pick the driver they really want to use along with the scenario analysis capability to figure out what would be the impact if the driver was changed or a different driver was proposed during an audit. So the visibility to what the drivers are and how does the total numbers do go for a change if there is a, a change in the way you want to allocate it. Also, the solution is now providing much greater visibility on the cost pool how is it collated, from which sources it is coming in, what's the cost for global headquarter, what's the cost of regional headquarter, and multiple segmentations on that was uh, required. For example, the split of an invoice into what's the cost of, let's say, regional headquarter on which the cost was charged versus what's the cost of global headquarter, which for region is a pass-through. So those kind of bifurcations clearly defined uh, even uh, easy recording and reporting of drivers so one can figure out okay for the last quarter these were the drivers which were uh, required or which were applied for the purpose of costing other was the cost attributable to local entities which are retained by regional headquarter clear visibility on these are the costs we are not able to push what do you want to do with that do we want to sort of go see motor take a disallowance do we want to really push it see again test the the local comfort with the push of cost so 
all those things, all those visibilities come into much greater control and data reliability coming to the, to the central teams. So for example, one of the key points was any exception that now needs to be generated in, in the transfer pricing policy has to be approved in system by the central lead. So anything, any exception that comes up, it's not that, okay, someone uh, maybe tweaked the form line in Excel without informing a lot of people centrally. So any exception would now need approval or, or a confirmation in the system by the lead. Uh, last but not the least, the solution focused on creating the dashboarding capability for client, which was about what's the summary of adjustments, uh, how many maybe transferizing adjustments might be needed, what should be the split in terms of transaction entities jurisdiction, how does this impact their ETR, and also at the same time, how does the profit allocation look across jurisdictions, which is maybe some of the other attributes such as if you have X number of employees in a jurisdiction or X number of assets in a jurisdiction versus the split of profit in a jurisdiction, those kind of capabilities are there for the client to look at and actually rethink if, if it's in line with how they believe the value drivers are scattered across. Now, one important point that comes up after this whole maybe end-to-end uh, -end data integration or getting more, I would say, analytical capability within transfer pricing, the important question is what's next? So if you could move to the next slide, but it's important to recognize that a digital transformation is a journey. So it's vital to make sure there's a greater return on investment being derived by the organizations. So once you have decided a platform, the possibility to add more modules in that platform needs to be evaluated because incremental modules might be more easier to deploy. And if there is already a data centralized, which can be used for different purposes, it can really help increase the utility of the overall platform. So just probably to, to think of few which are close link, one could be the country by country report. Now, if your data competition or the existing uh, data lake already has the PNL attributes, which you are using for your intercompany computations, it already has, let's say the balance sheet data. Now, Technically, creating a country-by-country -country report would not be uh, fully challenging because you already have the data set identified, which also makes sure that data is more centralized. The second that comes to mind is the regulatory and tax reportings. Different countries have different reporting formats. Now, once you have centralized data, the same could be used to uh, provide a consistent reporting. Now, in this regard, it's also important probably to make a point that is heightened focus on regulators on different intercompany arrangements and their reporting. And which has also brought now a lot of C-suit attention to the tax data management, tax data reporting. Maybe one such example to cite is the, let's say, SEBI requirements in India for reporting the intercompany transaction by the listed entities. So they need to really report the transactions entered by the companies, by their subsidiaries. And we have been observing a lot more interest of different companies to really understand how they can leverage upon technology to do these reportings rather than trying to figure out something manually, which leaves a chance of also, in a way, reporting differentiated data or inconsistent data. So there is increased focus even beyond tax on functions to see whether the intercompany reportings are in line with how they would expect it to be, which needs to be kept in mind. In addition, uh, Daniel, you already touched upon Web 2.0. If you want to further talk about how we can leverage upon an integrated manner before we hand over back to Mark. Taking it forward? Sure. I mean, I think it's really apt that we end this with BEP 2.0, right? Every time I think about BEP 2.0, I think I need a drink. Um, these days, BEP 2.0 is just, it's incredibly complex, the things that you need to consider, right, from a systems perspective. Um, I'll give you some concrete examples. You look at, for example, Pillar 1, Amount A, which focuses on allocating, you know, residual profits to local markets that don't have a physical presence, right? At the moment, the sourcing rules require you to link to, 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 to determine how much market is within a country based on some indicators. Like, for example, um, if it's involving the delivery of goods, the addresses of where those goods are being delivered. Or if you're an online advertising service, um, where do your viewers actually view that advertisement physically? Right. How do you do that? Well, the only way you can do it is to actually link operational business data with your financial tax information, right? Something that we probably weren't really used to thinking about before, right? 
you look at amount B, where you're supposed to monitor the um, profits for all of your distribution and sales entities, right? Um, it's going to be a, a, a headache trying to do that for every single entity you've got within the group. You look at pillar two top up taxes, right? For you to be able to monitor, calculate your top up taxes, um, you need to be able to monitor the effective tax rates of all of your jurisdictions, of, of all the, the entities in all the different countries, right? You need to manage your deferred tax asset calculations for your entities, right? You need to calculate the actual top up taxes. You need to then trace all of the different paying entities based on you know shareholder data. Um, who's the majority shareholder, minority shareholder? What happens if you've got a JV? Who ends up being a paying entity for that, right? Very complicated. A lot of complexities here from a data perspective if you want to implement BEPS 2.0 correctly. So I think the question of whether you need a point-based or an end-to-end -end solution, it's, it's really not, it's no longer a question of when you need that end-to-end -end solution. It's, 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 you know, how quickly you can actually implement it now. Um, back to you, Manmeet. Sure. So I think, Mark, uh, we can take it forward moving to Q&A, if that's okay. Yeah. And, and I think that's just a really nice way to cap it off, just to understand that sort of continuous improvement process. It is a bit of a journey. Sometimes that can be lost in all of this, that there is a, a gradual pr a process to understand. Um, mm. So to everyone in, in listening in, um, we are open up to questions and answers, and we have been getting a few questions in the Q&A box um, throughout. So I'll go through a couple of those to ask the group. But if you do have any, please go to the Q&A box and feel free to add some. I'm just looking at a couple of these, Dan and Mamit, and I think this one looks uh, quite good. It said, given we've seen the earlier poll question regarding the prioritization of digital transformation, the digital transformation process, uh, in your experiences, do you think taxpayers are keeping pace with revenue authorities? I think that's a pretty good one, that one. Yeah, uh, <laughs> good question. Um, my honest opinion is maybe not to the extent that they should be. I think um, one of the issues that we face with all of these conversations we have is that we find that most taxpayers are, are, are quite reactive when it comes to you know digital transformation that they need to do. Rather than doing it proactively, um, you wait first until the tax office goes, oh yeah, what's your next compliance requirement that you need? Right. What, what's next that you need to submit? And then you sort of react to what, what the tax office asks from you. Right. Whereas tax um, authorities um, in most surveys that we've seen, they've been actually much more proactive in the space in terms of you know, data, using programs for your data analytics to go through taxpayer data, et cetera. So I think we are sort of in a back foot um, as taxpayers. Manmeet, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, thanks, Daniel. I think you covered it well. Uh, just to add on, I think tax leaders already do recognize that uh, the tax authorities are really rapidly accelerating their tax journey and probably even faster than what majority of the tax leaders would have initially factored. If you see most mature jurisdiction already have the infrastructure to receive, compile, collate, or even share taxpayer data through different uh, governments or different agencies. So technology is already being used by tax authorities even to identify risk or do the tax fraud detection prevention mm -hmm. i think given that journey uh, there is no point like you said of what but when would the tax payers really look into this but i would just factor my initial response during the first poll uh, mm -hmm. the tax payers are really dealing with multiple priorities and when i club it up with a great amount of uh, attrition that they have faced. I mean, implementation usually then takes longer than in last time. I mean, when you look at mm. a project like that, you keep on thinking, do you have the right resource with you? Yeah. And and I think that's it. So, I mean, by definition, we're probably going to be a bit more reactive as new laws come in and things like that. And the format of how to um, make disclosures and things like that, that is at the behest of the revenue authorities. But certainly that competing environment, that push-pull environment that tax leaders are having to deal with is, is um, it's a tough one to navigate. Uh, just looking at a couple of other questions here. So Daniel Mamed, in your experience, um, when have you seen some of the more enhanced solutions? And so that would be similar to the case study too, and, and some of the next-gen ERP implementations. Mm. Um, 
what have you seen works well in terms of resourcing of the tax team when these sort of projects have been kicking off? Mm. I, I think that's a very challenging question because in terms of resourcing, I mean, I guess one of the main takeaways is that you really need a dedicated dedicated resource to sort of um, spearhead a lot of these initiatives, right? Um, I think one of the problems that um, we're seeing is that if clients don't have a dedicated resources who has that skill set or that you know knowledge of technology, for example, it becomes much more challenging. So you really need that dedicated person um, in house. Um, you know, in terms of, I mean, it's probably easier said than done because, I mean, a lot of the times we see that, you know, we're all, I mean, even myself, I mean, we all started off as tax people or transfer pricing people, right? We sort of needed to learn the hard way, you know, how technology works, like what are the ERP systems out there? What are the enterprise solutions out there? So, um, you know, get it, it, it's, a, it's a very rare skill set. We can sort of combine this, the, the, the capabilities of both. Right, and it's really those teams who are able to do that who are, I think, most successful in their yeah. in their journey. Uh, I, I don't know, Mimi, did you have? Is that does that sort of echo your own experience? I mean, I, mean, I, I guess you probably got some data under that one, given it was your case study. But certainly, what I'm seeing observation-wise, and just sort of backing what Daniel said, a dedicated resource has typically been very, very helpful. And mm -hmm. there have been a few people that I've spoken to, some heads of tax, who have said that if they had their time again, they probably would have done that. And they knew mm -hmm. that might have been at the detriment of other things that they're trying to do, the competing priorities, essentially. But what they did say is that certainly having that sort of lynch or sort of connection with what the business needs, what tax needs, and the people who are running those sort of projects, they think that's been, a, that is a really, really important factor for mm -hmm. these type of projects. Um, I mean, sorry. Yeah, I think uh, you completely. Uh, with what you and Daniel have mentioned, it's very important to have a team member within tax with clear responsibility for implementation. I mean, if you put additional responsibilities in to the team member, might feel like additional initiative rather than a key priority for the function. Because if you see, uh, it's it's difficult to risk transformation as a part-time role. So to derive the maximum value, it's very important to have the right skill set and right person actually deployed to drive the initiative. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I, I, here's a couple more questions. Uh, I think we might have time for one more. So based on your experience over the years with these sort of projects, uh, I think this person's talking about operational TP more probably. Um, what are some of the key takeaways or learning that might be of interest? So I think here's probably where we're getting to is what are some of the, the quick sound bites from your OTP experiences? Right. Uh, I mean, do you want to take this? I mean, so basically, in a, in a large organization, what we are experiencing in multiple mm -hmm. scenarios is implementing a project of this size requires a lot of efforts, involvement, investment. So it makes sense, and increasingly, people are looking at implementing even in a in a piecemeal basis to say, okay, why don't I pick up few jurisdictions where I really have a complicated structure to manage, or where I have actually real tax cost incurring, whether it's on account of uh, exchange control regulation that I, if I pay more, I'm not able to get the money back. It could be on account of uh, historical instances where they are paying high amount of customs and later on a true up, but it's difficult to recover the custom. So uh, the clients are focusing on key priorities where they have a larger uh, tangible impact. So it's okay not to sort of think of a big bang implementation, but go on pieces and continue to add on modules or entities. Uh, totally agree. And I mean, I definitely say, Try to keep some parts of it simple. I think tax and transfer pricing is hard already. So <laughs> trying to diagnose the problems and all that and adding complexity to that part of the process, uh, there's no point in doing that. And that's why even just some of the frameworks we talked about, we tried to simplify the frameworks because it can allow you to more quickly diagnose the problem or diagnose or identify quick, quick wins. And that's the Dan's case study. Identifying mm -hmm. the quick win really was a game changer for that client. Because it's really all they had to work, uh, that they could work with, but it had such a big effect on things. And that's to my main point too that it's not big bang because a lot of these smaller quick win projects, all the learnings get lifted 
into the more enhanced solution down the track. So the, the other benefit, and this is what I found as another takeaway, is that even just some of these quicker wins, it's actually an education process for the for the tax teams. So they're actually starting to see more opportunities beyond just transfer pricing. But then I think I think your last bit before we wrap up. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree to everything you guys said. I mean, um, maybe from me, one of the biggest takeaways is maybe just that aggregation of all of this different data that traditionally we weren't too fussed about. I think that's really become a priority these days. I mean, being able to have that central data lake where your finance team, your tax team, your TP team, they can all pull together and, and, and sort of pull out the same information. I think that's really key. And I think the example I gave about BEPS 2.0, about being able to link your, your operational data, your tax data, your financial data. I mean, it's, I think doing things manually, it's just not commercial any longer. It's just not feasible. It, it, the reality is, we, I, I reckon we just need to move away from that, right? You have to piecemeal solutions, but don't lose sight of that end objective going to the, at the end to end, I reckon. Yeah. So unfortunately, that is all we have time for. Daniel Mami, thank you. And special thanks to all who were able to join us. We'd like to encourage you to fill out the short mm -hmm. survey that will pop up on your screen momentarily and tell us what you think about today's program. If you joined us late, please note that the presentation will be archived for future viewing. If you feel that others would benefit from this webcast, and please share the webcast via the share this icon or have them visit the debriefs website. Uh, we will respond to all the questions submitted during the webcast in a couple of weeks. And also, if you think of any other questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to either me or our speakers. Uh, we'll be more than happy to talk to you. And please don't forget to tune in to our next scheduled webcast from the Geography Updates on 14 February, titled 2023 Japan Tax Reform Proposals, International Tax Policy and Geopolitics. From all of us at Deloitte, thank you for your participation in Deloitte's Asia-Pacific Tax Webcast today. Goodbye.